see, do you see this uh, in the background, like what it says? Well, you want me to give you my finger wave? <laughs> you can give it to me too if you want. My brother will come before me, his name Mwamba. Oh, really? <laughs> Interesting, interesting. So you won't struggle at all. If you could just say it one time and then we'll get going. This is a Mwamba moment. Life is made up of moments. Some great ones, some terrible ones. Moments make up the man or woman. What do you do to prepare for that? What do you do when it has arrived? What do you do when it has passed? You don't make the moments. The moments make you. This is the Mwamba Moments. Welcome to the Mwamba Moments, a new segment, another segment with uh, this time uh, a legend, uh, an impactful and very, very instrumental individual within the game of of basketball, but um, and beyond. Uh, We're here with Dikembe Mutombo, thank you so much for agreeing to be with us here today. Thank you for having me. So uh, we're going to start with some rapid fires, and I just want to hear, well, you don't even have to expand on the answers. I just want you, whatever, first thing that comes to mind with the first question being, and you played in multiple cities, right, in the NBA. So what do you, would you say was the best city that you played in? I think it's very difficult. I always get that question, and I, I try to not pick a one particular city because i um, I was one of the players who did have a wonderful career. Yes. Every city that I went to, or every team that I was fortunate enough to play for, uh, did have a success after my arrival. So there was no way, there was no place where I went where we didn't have success. And um, I enjoyed those places, but there's a particular reason where I settled down in Atlanta because when I came in, um, I just loved the trees and uh, I loved the climate. And I was coming from Denver where it snow almost every day. Yep. <laughs> when I arrived here, there was no snow at all. And every day I wake up, I can see the blue sky. I can see the sun and um, my wife and I just look at ourselves, look at each other. We say that we're going to settle here. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, you had a lot of great teammates of you, obviously. This might be a very hard question. And I, I know for me, too, if I have to think back, I'd have to take some time. But your favorite team, whoever like you're still close with right now, I guess would be the best answer. Your favorite teammate, your um, closest teammate. I, I stay close to with so many guys that I play with. Uh, Go back to my Denver day with uh, Lofonso Alex, uh, Steve Smith, Robert Pat, uh, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, some of the guys that uh, that helped me shine my career. Yes, uh, I'm still very close to them. Um, coming to Atlanta, I'm very close with uh, um, Steve Smith. You know, we live on the same street. Okay. Our wife, we have the same birth, your birthday. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, we we have so we got married on the same day, the same year. No way. To the honeymoon in the same cities. So there are a few things that we have in common. Um, almost um, like you go to Philly, um, I'm still close with Allen Iverson, you not know, just because we all went to Georgetown, but the bond that we was able to create. Um, right. Um, Eric Snow, Aaron Marquis, uh, all those guys. Uh, um, I stay very close to them and go to New Jersey, like with Jason Kidd, uh, um, Richardson, all those guys. And I'm, I'm still talk to them. I see some of those guys a lot. Because of being an NBA Global Ambassador, right. I'm about to visit so many cities in the course of the year. So right. I don't have to allow my teammates. Uh, in Houston, in particular, where I still have a home, a second home there, That's right. I go there and I see a lot of my former teammates. Uh, That's right. That's right. China, where I go a lot, uh, I see Yao Ming a lot uh, and Tracy McGrady. 
Yes, that's right. That's right. We're going to ask the next question is going to be uh, your favorite current player. Just one, though. You have to pick one. Favorite current player. You don't have to explain why. Just one. Um, today, if I, I, I would like, I, I pick Giannis. You know? Okay. Out of the uh, not because he's uh, an African. No. Nah. I think because of the gift of the talent that he has. Got you. Uh, I think he brings a lot to the plate. And, um, I would love um, to pick him as uh, one of my players, first player on the team. That's right. That's right. Now, your, fir- your favorite North American dish, what would you say it is? My favorite North American dish, you know, I, I love seafood. Um, I eat salmon every day. Okay. And pasta. If I can eat salmon with pasta and tomato sauce, I can eat a Monday to Sunday with no problem. <laughs> and, and that was one of my dish for my entire career. That's what <laughs> I you did healthy and strong. The game. That's uh, right. That's right. I passed a lot. Now I, I got to, you know. Lunch. I ate it like a, three hours before the game. I will eat a small portion. And after the game, I go to a restaurant. I will order some pasta. Eat again. some more. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So we know you from the motherland. You know, we're coming. Like, that's what we have in common from straight from the yeah, Congo. Raised from Congo. You can't take it up away from me. You get of Congo. Now you gotta tell me then what's your favorite dish? Cause people want to know if you're still eating fufu. Uh, my my favorite dish is this uh, simple, you know. As long as uh, my father, I'm glad you asked me that. My wife just cooked a fufu before yesterday. Come on, uh, uh, it was the best meal I have had in a long time. With some fish, it's your I have fufu, guy. and I have a rest sniper. Okay, and we call it lingala mbondo. And uh, with uh, with some pondo, there you go. And, uh, uh, we mix up some biloji and all of that stuff. It was the best, man. It was the best. By the time I finished eating, I was laying on the couch just looking at the sky. <laughs> I didn't want to be bothered. And uh, I don't know. I was uh, able to eat fufu every day as a child to the time I came to you to the US. And uh, I wonder how come it didn't make me go to sleep when I was going to class. <laughs> now since I've been in America over 30 some plus years, um, I have a hard time eating fufu, but if I eat fufu, that means I need a couch to be nearby. <laughs> I need at least two hours to three hours where nobody doesn't have to bother me. I love it. I love it, man. I love that. Something, something have happened with my stomach. And uh, it's it becoming like a, uh, a sleeping pills. <laughs> when I, I'll rather eat food for going to sleep than take the sleeping medicine. And that's the best way to go to sleep. <laughs> that is amazing. Amazing. We'll, we'll get right into the questions that I have for you. I love that. Matt, like, it seems I can sense the culture inside of you is still present and vivid inside of you. One, but do not, to me, you, you cannot try to erase what made me to be Dikembe Mutombo Polondo Mukamba Diken Jean Jaguar Mutombo. I would ask you to say you that again, look but. At the name and you can see where I come from and what made <laughs> me that guy. Absolutely. Why so many names was given to me? You know, mm-hmm. I am a warrior. You know, I carry my tradition with me wherever I go. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's amazing. That's amazing to hear, man. How how does it feel, right? You especially in the era that you played. Now you see a lot more people from the continent of Africa who have surged into the spotlight. You know, um, you see the 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 Sergi Bakas, and you see there's always there's other as, as well from different uh, countries in Africa. How, how does it feel to kind of have been uh, sort of like the pioneer to be one of the, the superstars, and obviously now a Hall of Famer, and who had a a great impact in in the game of basketball um i feel lucky i feel fortunate enough and i feel blessed to be in the shoes that god put me in and uh it comes with a lot of responsibility to carry on your daily basis to always look beyond your shoulder 
make sure that you don't mess up, you don't screw up in your life, that you stay as best as possible, as a best or a positive example for the future generation. It's a lot. There's a lot of pressure. <coughs> and um, I'm happy that I was able to be a the face and uh, to leave that door open for the next generation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that, especially coming from the continent of Africa, the country of Congo, and uh, of course I've been through it as well, I feel like there's, there's a greater sense of urgency coming, <laughs> like being an outsider. You didn't grow up in the US, you didn't play you know, everything in the US and you didn't really learn and wasn't taught everything in the US. I'd like to know some of your journey from the Congo, how it led you to um, you know, North America, and then eventually, obviously, the NBA. And I and I want to find out too. Do you feel that just coming from there was what gave you that sense of urgency to be the person that you are and 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 have the character that you have? No, you might we might say yes. I think uh, there's an urgency when it comes to discipline. Mm -hmm. There's an urgency that that playing your life on the fact that you come from nothing and you got here within a land of opportunity and um, you want to be the best example for the, the generation that might come after you and you want to be the best example for the country where you come from, for the continent you come from. You want to be the best example for the province where you come from. You want to be the best example from the village where you, you know you come from. Because they say that uh, there are a lot of people that where I come from, the child is not born, the child is born in a family, but is raised by the village. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a responsibility that falls onto the people who live in the village that protect you, that make sure that you're becoming a great product for the society. Um, I was lucky and fortunate to be raised by my father and my mother, both who are now here today with us. But I think the community where I was brought up plays some role in my life and um, those people in the community also contribute some value uh, the way i behave the way i carry myself and, uh, so i was obligated to make sure that i do well i succeed then i can go home and go to contribute you know because there's a great african proverb that says that when you take the elevator to go up, you always have to make sure that you send that same elevator down mm. because there's someone who's waiting to take that same elevator. I love it. I, I was put in that elevator to go up, to come to America, uh, to be given a chance, an opportunity, and I took that chance and I succeed. What is holding me up to send that elevator down? So I think I've sent my elevator down I love and it. I've seen so many young Africans who have taken the same elevator to go up. And I, that, I think that would bring more joy and satisfaction in my life. I, I love that. I love that. And you talk about the village kind of raising you. And um, it, it just leads me to think about, and the reason why I asked that question is because a lot of the times, you know, people feel like, oh, well, I'm not from that place that, you know, this person is specifically from, or I don't have those skills that that person has. So I don't know if I can reach that level of success. And clearly you, you know, being one of the first. No, you don't have the skill. It's about, you have a, a, a moral drive inside of you, something that drives you every day that make you go for something that make you think that hey i need to take one more step mm. i cannot just stay on the first floor 
I got moved to the second floor. I got moved to the third floor. I got to go see what goes on in the 10th floor. Yes. You cannot be working in a building that is um, 90th floor or 80th floor. But you never ask the security guy, can they allow you just to ride in an elevator to go up and come down? Yeah. To just see what is up there. Yeah. Or uh, you just please for the fact that uh, you work in the front desk. You just want to come from the garage, go to the front desk. That's it. So, I love it. I love it because you you've always wanted to reach that next level and get that next level. And right now, you're regarded as one of the greatest defensive players in the NBA history. Obviously, we mentioned already being a Hall of Famer. When we talk about defense in the NBA, we always say it's always said that it, you know it requires a lot of effort, right? Consistency. It's an effort thing, right? Because you gotta choose. You gotta choose to play to want to play defense, and 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 also as a you know specialist in shot blocking ability, right? You have to be fearless because you hey you can't be thinking about you know hey I'm gonna get dunked on. No, you're going up with and without any fear. Can you tell us what exactly was that one thing that was pushing you to always bring that same effort? And always have that level of fearlessness, right? And I'm wondering if it has to do with the way you were raised with that Mamba, the village. Mamba, it's all about gold. Living a life without no gold, I mean, you are failure. Mm. You got to have gold in your life. You have to set your goal. And you got to try to accomplish it. And you, sometimes you might not accomplish it, but you can reach it. You might not get to the summit of the mountain, but as long as you put the effort to touch the summit, you can say, I did get it. I might have not sit on the summit, but I was there, I touched it. Love it. And my goal was always to go out every given night and try to make myself one of the best defense basketball players and play this game. I knew those who came before me who have surpassed me with different numbers. Then I was always say, if they was able to make it, why not me? You know, because we're all playing basketball. What stopped me to also block as many shots as I can and to become like Hakeem Olajuwon or Karim Abdul-Jabbar or Bill Russell and all of that. Because I was lucky and fortunate to meet those people in my life and to talk to them to watch them. So some I, I might have learned something, you know. As being from Africa, they always tell us that when you go somewhere, there's a bushes, there's a little savanna or forest. Don't start walking on that forest without asking the people close to that savanna village, what is inside here? If I go this way, where am I might end up getting? It's all seeking the advice. Have you ever tried to seek the, adv the advice to those who came before you or those who have gone before you? That's the mistake so many of our young players are making today. Mm. Everybody want to make in the NBA. Everybody want to play in the NBA. Everybody want to play in the NFL or soccer major league, MLS or whatever. But nobody see now it's not taking time to trying to go ask some of the former players. Just sit down even for 10 minutes. Man, what was like being up there? What made you to get here? What did you do? What did you hear? And what was your mental preparation? You know, those things. You don't go a, a doctor don't go and open someone a brain or a stomach if you have not done that before in the medical school. That's, right. That's why they have uh, those dummy and those mommy, those cadavers, those dead people there in medical school that any human being who want to become a doctor can try to open it. A really human being who's not, but is not alive, but 
is still a human being, a dead human being, to see what is inside a human being. So I did that. I graduated, and uh, my coach was a good friend of uh, my late coach, who just uh, passed away two weeks ago, as you yeah. know, yeah. Tom Thompson. And um, introduced me to be Mr. Russell, who won 11 ring and 10 fingers with the Boston Celtics, to just talk about what it's like playing defense. And uh, I spent some quality time with him, and I learned a lot. He didn't have to be with me every day. But he spent like two days and a half with me, and then he walked with me. 30 years ago, he told me, Mutombo, I see you play in college. You have the ability. If you can go out and do what I'm telling you today, you have a chance to become one of the great uh, defenders that haven't played this game. And I listened to advice, and I took it. I went and exercised it. It's good to get an advice. But can you put that right. same advice that the, what you learned from what was taught, what's given to you and put that in practice? And I put mm. that in practice. Mm. Man, uh, I just love it because I also, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in the importance and the power of mentorship. And that, that's what you're touching on right now. Understanding that, you know, to gain that next level, you have to be able to also see people who have been there and ask them questions about it right now. I'm interested this to know, like, of course, you had great lessons that, you know, uh, Bill Russell must, must have told you and everything like that. And the other people you may have consulted. I'm wondering now what on your old journey, and I'm sure you're learning, you're continuing to learn as you go on and still being an ambassador for the league. What has been the greatest lesson you would say that basketball has taught you? Um. I would have not been the Dikemi Mutombo that I am today if because it was not uh, of the game of basketball. I would have not accomplished what I've accomplished in my life as I'm speaking to you today. Mm -hmm. uh, if I have not played the game, I don't know what I might have been able to do. Uh, I know that uh, I have a dream as a childhood. Uh, my childhood dream was to go to medical school. But I don't know how many doctors, Mamba, in your life, you know, who have gone and built a $30 million hospital, who are in the process to go and take the challenge of uh, running the hospital from uh, 20,000 miles away and taking all the challenge of uh, going to build a $4.5 million school and uh, trying to run as well. Um, I don't know there's not many doctors that I, um, it's a big challenge that I took in life. And all of that comes from some of the self-discipline that I learned through the game of basketball. Mm. It takes a discipline to succeed in sport. And uh, it was a lot discipline put in. There's no other better answer than that. It was a discipline. Because mm. you cannot be drunk and trying to come to play the game the next day. They might, they might break your neck and they might break your arm. And okay. you might be getting a foul trouble and be out of the game in two minutes. That's right. You um, take this. For you to get this. <laughs> <laughs> it takes this for you to get this. It takes this for you to get that. Man, listen. That's real. That's really good. That's really good. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask this question in, in, in French, right? Um, bien sûr, venant du Congo, venant de l'Afrique, wow. c'était quoi exactement qui t'a amené au sport de, de, du basket? Bien sûr, on sait, tout le monde le sait que, que, que tu es une, une personne qui a déjà non, une grande détail. C'est quoi qui t'a amené? Les gens doivent comprendre que j'ai la chance et l'opportunité d'avoir une bourse d'études pour aller étudier à Georgetown et faire la médecine. C'est la raison pour laquelle je suis venu en Amérique. Je ne suis pas venu en Amérique parce que je faisais des mètres vingt, disons, et quelqu'un m'a dit, oh non, viens avec moi, on va, tu vas aller jouer en Amérique. Non. En Amérique, si tu veux, aller, tu veux faire du basket, il faut aller à l'école. Tu dois faire l'université. Ce n'est pas comme aujourd'hui où tout a changé. 
où tu peux venir de, à, de high school directement, tu peux aller à l'MBA si tu es bon. Moi. Les gens comme nous qui n'ont pas eu vraiment beaucoup d'expérience de basketball, c'était difficile. Et pour moi, c'était la médecine. Et je crois que mes études m'ont permis de me retrouver dans le monde de basket. Et euh, j'étais bien guidé, bien coaché, bien formé par un bon entraîneur que je qualifie comme l'un des meilleurs entraîneurs des États-Unis, euh, qui vient de nous quitter il y a deux semaines, euh, mm -hmm. qui s'appelait John Thompson. Mm -hmm. C'est grâce à lui que j'ai eu la chance, l'opportunité de bien s'évoluer et de devenir ce que je suis aujourd'hui de Kémé Moutombo. Mm. Alors, pour, pour les jeunes qui, qui, qui te voient et qui veulent devenir comme toi, que ce soit des joueurs de basket, que ce soit des joueurs de, de football américain, que ce soit des joueurs de, de soccer, n'importe quelle personne qui veut atteindre un but euh, qui est vraiment difficile à, difficile à atteindre, quel, quoi, que dirais-tu était la, la, la chose la Tout plus est difficile, plus... attention, moi, bah, tout est difficile dans la vie. Rien n'est facile dans la vie. C'est ce que mon, mon père, qui n'est pas aujourd'hui avec nous, me disait chaque fois. Mon fils, rien n'est facile dans la vie. Tout est difficile. Pour atteindre un niveau dans la vie, il faut du travail. Pour mm. atteindre un niveau dans la vie, il faut des efforts. Mm. Pour atteindre un niveau de la, dans la vie, il faut avoir des disciplines. Si vous n'avez pas de discipline, vous n'avez pas de discipline morale. D'avoir des déterminations, d'arriver là où vous allez, vous n'allez pas arriver. Mm. Ça, ça, ça c'est vrai. Ça, c'est vrai. Je, je me demande aussi, en tant que, en, 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 tu es arrivé finalement, tu as quitté le, 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 le Congo, tu es arrivé voilà. à l'université, tu es finalement arrivé aussi dans, dans la NBA. Je Et attends, demande, il faut leur dire, j'ai étudié à l'université pendant 4 ans. Tu vas étudier à l'université pendant 4 ans. J'ai étudié ce que j'allais en classe, de 8 heures jusqu'à 16 heures. Et j'allais m'entraîner de 16h jusqu'à 19h. Et aller encore à la maison manger, et il a encore fait des devoirs, et continuer à se concentrer malgré la fatigue mm. pour arriver au sommet là où je suis arrivé. Et préparer à jouer trois matchs par semaine, ou bien deux matchs par semaine, et voyager aussi. Ce n'était pas facile. C'est là où beaucoup de gens n'arrivent pas à comprendre. Et quoi qu'on te lance là-bas seulement, on dit c'est fini, tirer la balle. Non. Il a eu des responsabilités que je devais faire aussi. Mes quatre classes, mes cinq classes que je prenais à l'université chaque semestre, j'avais des devoirs à remplir. J'avais des livres à lire. Et je devais aussi me concentrer physiquement et moralement quand j'arrive aux entraînements afin que je sois des meilleurs parmi les douze joueurs qui étaient là. Je devais faire la compétition avec les autres qui étaient des meilleurs. S'il n'y avait pas la compétition, je n'allais pas arriver là où je suis arrivé. Tu as parlé, tu as mentionné ton parcours, tu as mentionné, la, comme ton père te disait, que c est, c est pour atteindre quelque chose, c'est toujours difficile. Ce n'est jamais facile, ça prend la discipline, ça prend beaucoup d'efforts et tout. Je me demande aussi, c'est quoi que tu dirais était le plus grand obstacle dans ta carrière que tu penses que tu as eu et comment tu as pu euh, 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 battre ça? Je, je me dirais que ça a à faire avec euh, mon arrivée en Amérique. Du fait que je suis arrivé dans un continent où je ne parlais pas l'anglais. Je ne connaissais pas très bien la culture américaine. Euh, je ne suis pas, je ne t'ai pas habitué à être exposé à beaucoup de la nourriture directement. Euh, je venais là au manger quoi, deux fois par jour. Quand tu manges le matin, tu attends jusque le soir quand maman va préparer vers 17h ou vers 18h pour manger. Mm. Euh, pendant qu'ici en Amérique, on mange presque chaque trois heures du temps. C'était mm. beaucoup d'adjustements. Euh, je suis arrivé dans un monde où je me sentais comme j'étais le seul noir parmi les autres. Pas seulement noir, 
aussi les seuls africains. Tu vois, chaque fois que j'allais, je, je prenais des classes où j'étais le, le seul noir à l'université. Et on n'avait pas, à cette époque-là, dans les années 80, on n'avait pas beaucoup de étudiants noirs à Georgetown. C'était un peu difficile. Et je devais sortir de l'université pendant que je savais que j'habitais à Washington, pendant que Washington DC était considéré comme la capitale des Noirs américains. Mais quand j'étais à l'université, je ne voyais pas ces gens-là, à part ceux qui, les gens qui travaillaient à l'université. Et je devais chaque fois sortir, me sentir un peu à l'aise. Il y a eu beaucoup d'ajustements que je devais faire aussi. La langage, je crois, c'était euh, le point le plus difficile. Les gens, tout le monde voulait te parler parce que tu faisais des mètres vingt. Les gens croyaient que tu étais dans l'équipe de basketball. Et ma première année à Georgetown, j'étais seulement un étudiant simple. Je n'étais pas dans l'équipe de basketball, je n'étais pas enregistré. Dans le, dans le département d'athlétisme, mais tous les étudiants me demandaient « Moutomo, monsieur Moutomo, euh, Moutomo, pourquoi tu ne joues pas tu, Pourquoi tu n'as pas joué aujourd'hui Comment quelqu'un comme toi, de tes grandes tailles, comme ça, tu ne fais pas partie de l'université ?» Je le disais chaque fois que je suis étudiant ici, je ne suis pas dans l'équipe de basketball. Mmh. Et c'était difficile de, quoi, de faire comprendre aux étudiants que j'ai eu ma bourse, j'ai essayé la boucle, ces études, je suis venu étudier, pas me considérer comme basketteur. Et ça a pris un peu le temps même à mes professeurs de comprendre que non, j'étais différent des autres. Voilà, voilà. Je, je, je crois que c'est juste inspirant de voir que quelqu'un avec ton parcours a pu faire quelque chose comme ça parce que ça inspire les jeunes, ça motive les jeunes aussi à comprendre que tout est possible et rien n'est impossible. La, la vie n'est pas seulement le sport, hein. Absolument, absolument. Et... Comme mon coach qui vient de quitter disait que la balle que vous jouez avec, un jour la balle n'aura plus d'air. Ce que tu dois chercher d'autres choses à faire. Mmh. Ce que tu n'auras plus cette balle-là avec toi dans la main. Absolument. Et, et... et qu'est-ce que tu feras le jour-là quand ça arrivera? Et ce sont des responsabilités qu'il faut prendre dans la vie. Il ne faut pas continuer à dire aux gens que non, je m'appelle Motombo, je suis joueur de basketball. Non, tu étais joueur de basketball mmh. dans notre époque. Et qui est aujourd'hui De quoi tu es devenu Parce qu'il a des responsabilités dans la vie, il faut apprendre. Il a des chemins à suivre dans la vie. Tu ne peux pas. Euh, Dérailler ta vie d'aller gauche à droite. Tu n'as jamais vu un train qui va gauche à droite. Le train va toujours comme ça. Mmh. C'est ça la vie. Mmh. Tu dois voir ta destination. Ton prochain arrêt, c'est quoi? Ton prochain arrêt tantôt, ça sera déterminer les études, te marier avoir des enfants, faire étudier tes enfants, devenir grand-père un jour, prendre soin de tes parents, tout ça, c'est quoi ton destin? Il ne faut pas dire que c'est marqué comme beaucoup de gens disent, « Oh, I'm just living my life. » Je vis ma vie, quoi, moi, je suis bien. Tu es bien, mais qu'est-ce que tu fais? Dans ta... C'est quoi tu fais? Tu es bien. C'est quoi ton, ton prochain destin? C'est quoi? Ça, ce sont des responsabilités que ça vient dans la vie. Et je suis fier de, de tout le monde là qui ont pu avoir les devoirs et les responsabilités de m'encadrer, de me diriger dans les chemins là où je suis allé et d'arriver dans ce point là où on se trouve aujourd'hui. Et je les remercie hein, parce que j'ai toujours dit que je ne suis pas ce que je suis aujourd'hui 
pas seulement à cause de mes parents. Ma mère et mon père ont contribué beaucoup. Mais là, il y a aussi d'autres qui ont contribué, comme on dit en Afrique. Un enfant, on l'enlève au village. Dans le seul village qui est le responsable d'enlever tous les enfants qui sont là. Et je crois que je suis sorti de ce village-là. I, I love it. I love it. I think I love everything that you just said. And I, I, I want to honor your time. And I want to end by asking uh, another question, just one question. And it has to do with leadership. Everything that you're talking about seems like you've been building up to be a great leader, right? And the beautiful thing that you're mentioning is that you're a great leader on and off the court, right? Which is extremely important for athletes to understand, just like you said. Your sport, whatever it is that you're playing, will end at one point, right? There will be a moment where it will end, and what are you going to do going forward? It might be in two years, it might be in three years, or ten years, it will end. I like the way you say that, Mama. It, it, it will it, end. Especially in football, you never know when it's going to be your last play. Even in basketball. It's very You know, true. the average year in the basketball career is a 3.5. Three exactly. and a half. People they, don't know that. Oh, they knew that I would turn my TV from October to June, I would watch the NBA. But sometimes they do forget the people you're watching today is not the people you watched yesterday. But they don't know that. Oh, they know that the ball is bouncing. Mm -hmm. But they, they didn't know that there was another ball there that was bouncing and it went flat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. So I, my question is really with regarding to leadership. And you've played with a lot of great players we mentioned at the beginning, a guy like uh, Allen Iverson. How did you let your leadership kind of, develop? I mean, you know, we all know the famous, hey, practice, we're talking about practice, but how did you kind of de 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 develop and express your leadership in a, an environment with a lot of personalities like that? And what's your relationship with him like? Oh, we did have a great relationship. Allen Iverson, maybe is one of the best teammates that I ever have. Um, um, one thing that I respect that man is his heart. You know, um, there's so many people are born in this world, but there's a lot of them are born with no heart. Mm. And you know that you play sport mm -hmm. to have that big heart of a warrior, someone who go up there with his size, with his uh, height and weight, with no fear, going in, putting 50 every, every, every giving nine. I tell you what, you can give me Allen Iverson on my team. Every given day through my career, I would play with him. You know, um, it's just amazing, it's phenomenal. Um, I was lucky. You know, I was lucky that I didn't play with him in college. I was lucky enough to play with him in the NBA. The excitement that we have, uh, the run that we have, uh, going up there and winning every given night, you don't get it from so many guys. I played in the league for so many years, but to know that, hey, you, Dikembe Mutombo, you will get five or seven block shots and 20 rebounds, and I will let my offense be taken care of by Allen Iverson, as we call him the answer. Yeah. Hey, you give me the answer every day, and I will not have no more questions to ask you. <laughs> what, what, what was his favorite, what was his leadership style that you loved about him the most? You talk about his, his approach to the game. Mm -hmm. It was different. Mm -hmm. He might be laughing with you guys, eating chicken wings on the locker room with you guys, and singing and listening to hip hop music. But when the belt rang, you see different Allen Iverson that you saw in the locker room. He knew okay. what time was the uh, it was what time it was time for business. I love that. I love that. Well, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I want to thank you so much for 
you know, um, agreeing to do this <laughs> and spending just a little bit of time with me. Hopefully we'll be able to do this again another time. Yeah, you will, you, you hope, but you got this finger ready. <laughs> Not in my house again. <laughs> oh, you know, you got amazing. this finger, so, you know. All right. Now, I will give you the other opportunity. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for having me at uh, Mwamba Moment, like you say, Zoom. <laughs> so I enjoy it. I think uh, your fans and your followers will get a chance to enjoy the conversation that we have. Amazing. And good luck to you and wish you the best success in your life and whatever you are trying to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know you do a lot of stuff for Africa as well, in the Congo specifically. I, I heard about the hospital that you're building. Any way that uh, we're building can... a school that will open in September 21 uh, with 820 students. Uh, will be free tuition. Uh, uh, the school will be named after my late father, Samuel Mutombo Institute School of Science and Technology. So. We'll be teaching about coding and technology, biology and chemistry Love and it. physics. So that's good stuff. My concern is uh, when are we going to train the next leaders of this world, the next scientists, where they going to come from? And uh, if we don't take that responsibility to train those future generation now, and uh, that future generation will judge us on the fact that uh, we were not able to give them all the tools to prepare them for tomorrow. And I feel it's a moral duty to us to make sure that those young people have what they need to face whatever challenge that will come after we're all gone. Amazing, amazing. And I wanna be part of the solution. Absolutely. Uh, thank you again, uh, uh, Mr. Dikembe. And um, I'll, I'll let you go. And I'd ask you also, how can we support and anything or any of your ventures? Who will ever want to support uh, those who feel that they can contribute? You can go to dmf.org. Um, you can see the work we are doing. And you can see where can we make changing. Uh, you can join us to our mission and uh, be part of the changing that uh, taking place, especially in Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, we want to improve the living condition of our people. We're not trying to do nothing else. Um, there's a lot of school there, there's a lot of hospital, but we just want to improve the level of education. We want, we want to improve the level of healthcare system by making it better for tomorrow and that's what we're doing what we're doing amazing thank you so much you said dmf.org um anybody that wants to help support thank you so much the kimbe mutombo for joining the muamba moments and that was another episode of the muamba moments thanks again thank you